Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our capacity audience. I am happy to introduce a man who needs no introduction. For the past 43 years, Leonard Pitts Jr. has worked at various times as a columnist, a college professor, a radio producer, a commentator, a journalist, and a lecturer. He will tell you he is a writer, and our readers embrace him as one of their favorites. A Pulitzer Prize winner for commentary, Mr. Pitts has won numerous honors over the years and has recently been named this year's winner of the Elijah Parrish Lovejoy Award. It's an award given by a Colby College recognizing individuals of our time who embody courageous journalism. In registering for this event, one of our readers thanked Mr. Pitts for his great humanitarian heart and his honest voice. Another thanked him for his insight and his capacity for outrage when deserved. There were a couple of invitations for dinner and a suggestion he moved to Maine. That's how much we admire him and his work. Before we start tonight, I just want to make mention that we have eight young journalists from the Youth Journalism International Organization joining us, including journalists from Morocco, Australia, and Colombia. And I will now turn the conversation over to Greg Kessich, who is the Portland Press Herald editorial page editor, and we'll be finish up the evening tonight with audience Q&A as time allows. Hey, thanks, Judy. And uh, welcome to Maine, sort of. Uh, you know, are we all... Uh all unmuted. And it's not really a Zoom call unless uh, somebody is has to be reminded to unmute. Um, so it's one of the, you know, great pleasures uh, of my Tuesdays to sometimes put your column on the page uh, and uh, put the little uh, shirt tail at the bottom of it. Um, and you write great leads. Right? We always uh, admire. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, I'm sure you've heard that. I, I want to go back to one uh, you wrote. Uh, this was published on September 12th, 2001. It's one of your more famous columns. Yeah. And um, I'm, uh, it's a very strong column about, uh, about the sort of the anger and the shock that so many people were feeling. Uh, but I just want to go to the lead. Um, uh, you start out, it's my job to have something to say. They pay me to provide words that help make sense of that which troubles the American soul. That's the first two sentences. Um, that's quite a job description. And yeah. I'm wondering, uh, you know, how did you come to understand that as your role? Uh, you know, obviously, I don't think that was the ad that you answered for the. <laughs> no, actually, the, yeah. the ad I answered was to be a music critic. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah. And by the uh, time I'd been their music critic for, three years, I had a cumulative 18 years of writing about music and couldn't take another teeny bopper concert. So that's, <laughs> you know, that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing now. But in terms of how I came to decide that, that was, that came pretty, pretty easily. And uh, it's funny that you mentioned that particular lead because those words are pretty literally what was going through my head because I was, I was watching the towers fall, watching the, you know, the, the nonstop news coverage and being shocked like everybody else was. And then at some point it came to me you're going to get a call in about a minute and somebody and they're going to say we need a call and yeah. you know and, and, I, and I, that's what i literally said it's, it's my job it's my job to have something to say about this i don't know what to say but it is my job to have something to say about this so those words were written almost as a realization that uh i needed to you know to, to be able to put some sort of handle on this mm -hmm. wake up yeah exactly wake wake up I, it's horrible it's awful now get to work that that's uh -huh. what those words mean so uh, what, what troubles the American soul? Uh, I guess that the biggest thing that troubles the American soul right now is whether the, the nation is, remains viable. Uh, when I first started um, questioning this a few years ago, it felt like you know, I was way out on a, on a limb. And now I find uh, myself you know, maybe still on a limb, but I've got a lot of company. A lot of people wondering uh, at the future of the American experiment, uh, you know, given the events of the last few years, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and sort of this sense of, of disunion and division in this country. I think January 6th, the events of January 6th really sort of sort of put that into concrete form for a lot of folks. Uh, I think that the, there is a very real question now, as, as um, two people put it on Twitter a few days ago, uh, about the salvageability of, of the nation. We are in we are in very dire times, and I think that uh, that it's incumbent upon us, particularly those of us who love what America is supposed to be, to uh, to recognize that. I think that there's a tendency to sort of shrug and say, "Well, yeah, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Everything, everything's going to be up because it's always been all right." But you know, they didn't know that 
you know, in, at, at the moment of the Civil War. They didn't know that during the Great Depression when uh, people were talking about uh, 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 socialist revolution in this country, they, you know, at these great hinge points in history, you know, we're thankful that it went the way that it did, but it could easily have gone another way. And I would argue that we're at another great hinge point in history and that we need to take it seriously as opposed to saying, you know, as opposed to, you know, accepting the false assurance that it's going to turn out okay because it's always turned out okay. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting. I mean, it's, uh, are, you, are you more or less optimistic? Depends on the day. Right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, it, dep it depends on the day. Uh, I am, I am, I'm hopeful, um, uh, probably more than I am optimistic. And that's probably a real fine, fine line. But I think I'm, I'm more hopeful than I am optimistic. Hopeful to me means that, you know, with work, we can we can do this. Optimism, I think, is more an expectation without necessarily that we're going to put a whole lot, we're going to have to put a whole lot of work in. But I think there's a lot of work that needs to be, that we need to do as Americans in this country to, uh, to restore, to restore this country. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. There's, um, you talk about that being in this uh, very dynamic period in history and, and it could go one way or another. Right. And, but there's so many um, things that just seem the same, you know, so there's a lot of, uh, uh, maybe scenery that 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 just feels very familiar. Like uh, I, you know, woke up this morning thinking, I'm gonna have to write about gun control again. And, oh uh, God, yeah. You know, and and I know exactly what the arguments for it and, and what the arguments are against it. I know what the policy proposals are gonna be. I know, yeah. you know, and um, and I kind of know where it's gonna end. I think I know where it's gonna end. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's that about? Yeah, it's funny because I have the same thing. I was going to not write about uh, this latest shooting just because I feel like I need to let some of them just go by me. But yeah. then I got but then I read a, a quote from a young lady in a um, in a New York Times article on the uh, victims of this latest uh, tragedy. And she says something to the effect of that she did. She had a, she lost a friend in this latest shooting and she didn't want her friend to become just another name with an age behind it. And that really, yeah, that really struck, that really struck me here because that's kind of how we, you know, especially in our business, have to deal with death in bulk. There's really no time to have the human feelings that you want, that you would want to have or that you should have because, you know, you're on to the next one. We're, you're dealing with death in bulk. We had barely absorbed Atlanta. And yeah. now, and, and now, now we've got Boulder. And as we're, as we're, as we're dealing with Boulder, something else is getting ready to, uh, to, to occur. So that, that quote from her just really struck me. And I it just struck, it just, it just jumped at me that I want to write my, my next column. And I just wanted to include a bunch of names that we've, you know, forgotten that we, that we were unable to celebrate because, you know, we were on to the next tragedy. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, what's your take on why um, it never seems to progress? I mean, we all experience the same thing, or we see the same events, but we don't, we we don't have uh, we have such different responses to it. Well, it's interesting. I think uh, we've got a political leadership that is increasingly disconnected from the wants of the people that they're supposed to be serving. It to me, it's a wake up call when the majority of the country and, and, and the majority of the re of Republican voters think that there needs to be some sort of uh, uh, voter, um, not voter, I'm sorry, uh, gun uh, registration, some sort of stricter laws uh, mm -hmm. in terms of registration, in terms of ID, in terms of waiting periods, all, all those things. It's, it's interesting to me when even Republican voters say, yeah, this is something that would be a good idea. And yet Republican legislators are standing four square against it still. It, it strikes me that you'll seldom see a starker illustration of the impact of lobbyists and money upon our supposedly representative government. Representative government is supposed to, you know, you would think uh, represent the, uh, the interests and the will of the people. Uh, but we're seeing less and less of that uh, as, as we have Lawmakers who are gerry, whose whose positions in in, in office, in national office, are gerrymandered to the degree that they don't have to worry about losing, you know, yeah. losing their jobs no matter what they do. And as the intrusion of of dark money uh, becomes ever more brazen in our politics, and then you combine that with this, uh, what we're seeing in these last few years, this sort of, uh, I used to call it truth optional or or alternative universe. I, I now call it uh, anti-truth. 
it's yeah. not just it's not just an alternative alternative to truth it is something that is that is actively seeking to destroy truth so you combine all those things and yeah it's uh it's 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 a real it's a fr- it's a fascinating time to be a journalist, but it's a frightening time to be a human being, at least a human American. <laughs> a human well, American. Those usually go together, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. It's not good for a living. I mean, you know, you talk about the divide, and and um, uh, you know, maybe one thing we all have in common is just this complete lack of trust for the other side. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, nobody seems to be coming at you know these issues with uh, in good faith, but they feel the same way. Yeah, uh, I, I, I get a little leery because it, it strikes me that, you know, you can you can go a little far down the road of false equivalents yeah, yeah. on that, as I, as I, you know, and I think that's a particular danger in, 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 in our business, in the news business, because we are trained, especially reporters, less so, you know, we opinion people, but reporters are trained, you know, to, uh, to, to, to try to hit it right down the middle. Uh, so when we look at what's going on in, in, in the country, I think that training turns out to be maybe a little bit of a, of a, of a flaw because it, what, we're, what we're seeing now is not right down the middle. And that's not to, to claim angel wings for the Democrats by any, by any means, but the party that has strayed demonstrably the most from the center line of American politics is the Republican party. They're the party that has, you know, that, that whose behavior has become the most outlandish, the most, um, you know, the, the most bizarre, especially if compared again with the center line of American politics in the last 20 years. There, there's nothing, I can't think of an, of an analog to this in, 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 the, in the broad sweep of our history. And I think that it's incumbent upon us in the news business and incumbent upon us as Americans to, to recognize that finally and fully before, before we can have any hope of, of making any move forward. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to both sides it, but yeah. I, I do, I, you know, anytime I engage with somebody, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, who believes very strongly this, the, you know, these Republican talking points, I don't think they're lying to me. I think they really believe Oh, no, it. no, no. Yeah. They believe it. And, and, and yeah. you know, and I think, I, I will say this much, I think you're starting to see as a reaction, uh, and this is completely anecdotal, so take it for whatever it's worth, but I think you're starting to see a, a, as, as a reaction, a, a corollary uh, sort of intolerance for, for you know, Republicans, right. you know, from, from the left, I think. And, you know, the, the bottom line is if all we have to offer one another is intolerance, uh, then we're in a world of hurt. I, I, I will say that. I will say that much. You we're going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're in, a, we're in a world of hurt, which is which is where we are. Yeah. You know, we, t- we talk about unity and I've written a lot about unity. But it, it, the one thing that keeps jumping out at me is that the times when we as a nation have been most unified have been when we either had a pressing emergency or some sort of sense of national mission. Other than that, where has unity been? On, on December 8th, 1941, we were, we were very unified. Two years later, there were race riots across the country. Right. You know, on September 11th, we were very unified. Uh, a couple of years later, not so much. Uh, I think, you know, paradoxically, I think, and probably counterintuitively, I think uh, the Soviet Union losing the Cold War was probably, you know, in the long run, not that good a thing for us. I mean, it's, it's a great thing for the world, don't get me wrong, but not so good for us in terms of national mission because so much of what we were, at least when I was a child, was defined by our opposition to them. Right. And, and now that opposition, you know, doesn't take the same form. It's not so much a pressing uh, issue for, for our kids. Uh, you know, Islamic extremism hasn't really, doesn't really fill, fill the same void. So what, you know, we, we come down to the very fundamental question of what draws us together as Americans, what makes us Americans. And it should be easy. It should be the, the values expressed in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. The problem is many of us haven't read those documents. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, so, so, so that doesn't stop together. us from having opinions about what are I know, it never yeah, does. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so, you know, <laughs> unity, unity becomes a lot more difficult to maintain, Yeah, you know. Uh, I want to back up a little bit something you said earlier about, um, you know, you're, you, said you have an unusual path to this job. Most of the, uh, yeah. the national columnists are either former reporters or they are, um, you know, from the news side or they're, um, you know, a lot of speech writers, uh, uh, people who come through politics. Um, how did you, how did you make this uh, start out writing about music and, uh, and, 
end up writing about uh, uh, national unity and. Well, the last few years of my music writing career, I was probably uh, a a pundit masquerading as a music critic because uh -huh. I took every I took every, and I think that's just because I was I was getting long in the tooth as a music writer. Uh, I had reached a point of saturation. It was it was the era of Milli Vanilli and an artist who was then billed as, as Snoop Doggy Dog, uh -huh. uh, New Kids on the Block, and I didn't love any of them. And uh, what I took to doing when I got to the Miami Herald was using the music column as a platform to talk about, to deal with social issues. I remember writing um, a piece about Elton John that was actually about AIDS because he was doing a, a, a big um, AIDS prevention uh, or AIDS advocacy uh, program at that, at that time. So I, used, I was using music as a jumping off point to talk about a lot of other issues, uh, not necessarily political. When uh, Eric Clapton had a song called uh, Tears in Heaven, which I, I used as a meditation on, on mortality, on, on, on you know, life, and, literally life and death. So I was, I was at that. I was, you know, using music as a as a as a prism through which to view other things. And at some point, when I just reached my saturation with uh, with new kids on the block, um, <laughs> give me seven hundred fifty words on new kids on the block. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I, I went to my editor and said, "Hey, I've got an idea. Why don't you just pay me to write about anything I want to write about?" And I expected, you know, I have expected to get booted out the door and told, you know, no, go into that. that that Millie Vanilli concert or whatever it was, but uh, they, you know, to my great relief, said, uh, "Yeah, we, we can do that." And that's that's how I end up here. And and what publication was that? Miami Herald. The Herald is the only. Oh, newspaper they were writing for the Miami before. Herald. But yeah. you said you started very young, though, right? Uh, I started. Uh, I started college at fifteen. I started professionally at eighteen with a, a a tabloid published in Los Angeles called Soul Magazine, which is a black entertainment uh, tabloid. Mm -hmm. And I started there as a stringer when I was a junior in, uh, in college. And uh, I think it was the Monday after I, after I graduated, I started at Seoul as associate editor and then became their editor. So that was, that was the beginning of, of, of everything, at least for professionally for me. So, you know, we all bring our life experiences to this work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how did that shape what you do now? In which the music? Yeah. Um, the thing about music and about, and about, um, pop, pop art, uh, pop culture in, in general, is that for me, it has always provided a prism through which to view history. So when we talk about, say, the 70s, uh, we talk about the, um, you know, the gas crisis and, and, and Jimmy Carter's famous malaise speech, although he never used the word malaise and so forth and so on. And I also think of, of the disco era, which to me was sort of this desperate attempt to dance our way out <laughs> <laughs> out of out of our malaise and misery. Uh, so there's always, you know, to me, you know, the, the, I, I'm always fascinated by the intersection. I've always been fascinated by the intersection of the arts and and the world around the arts, the world in which the arts take place. That to me has always been a fascinating thing. Little little discussed, but 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 very interesting. I look at you know. Um, you know, comic books from the from the 1960s that I grew up reading, and I didn't realize it at the time. But you go back and read them now, and they're all, you know, let's kill the communists. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, Iron Man becomes Iron Man because he's, you know, because of an evil communist warlord. It, it's it's just, and I didn't realize all of this at the time. But sure. it's it's again, it's that intersection of of pop art and what's going on in the, in, the, in in the larger world. So that's that I think it's probably you see a lot of that in my in my column. I think I'm the only columnist that will go from quoting Nietzsche to quoting Springsteen. You know, <laughs> and, and and feel and feel no 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 leap or, or or no stress in doing that. Well, subscribers will have to do a Google search on that and see if anybody They can find it. I'm pretty sure I quoted yeah. I, I know I quoted Springsteen. I'm pretty sure I quoted Nietzsche. I think you might you might yeah. be uh, you know, I, I said to you earlier, I, I, years of after reading you, I, I always assumed you were in Miami, you know, because you mm -hmm. were in Herald and, and found out that you're in, um, uh, you're, you live in the D.C. area. Right. And, uh, you don't read like a, uh, like a D.C. columnist. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Um, I'm not sure you like a Miami columnist, but, but I don't know what that means. But, uh, <laughs> but I've you never know. felt like a D.C. columnist. Um, you know, I, I've never felt an obligation to uh, to cover policy. And that's not to say that that covering policy or writing about policy is a bad thing. I think somebody's got to do it. I just don't think it's me. Uh, I, I prefer writing about the stuff that 
people are talking about in the checkout lines at the supermarket that people are talking about over their back fence. Um, I'm more concerned with the morality of the policy or what the policy says about the, about the country than about handicapping the odds of passing the policy. If that makes any sense. I, sure. I, you know, I, I don't really, you know, I, I can't say I don't care about it. I care about it as an American who votes, but I don't care about it as a writer in the sense that this is a subject that's gonna be of interest to me. I like to write about stuff that, that, that people are talking about. I think a lot of times uh, with Washington, Washington is writing for Washington. You know, everybody, you know, the, everybody in the town who's writing is writing for somebody else in the town. And I've never really had that interest. Um, and maybe it's because I got here relatively late in life. I was, oh my gosh, uh, probably late thirties, I guess, when I, when I got here. So I was, I was fully formed. I was not shaped by Washington. It's just someplace else that I've lived. I grew up uh, in, in LA. So to the degree that I've been shaped or formed by anything, I've been, I was shaped and formed by that, which of course carries its own set of baggage. But, but, but part of the baggage it doesn't carry is the need to, to be seen at, uh, you know, at the ambassador's cocktail party or to be read by this academic or that pundit or whatever. I really have no interest in that. That's not, that's not who I am. Yeah. Um, so. One of the things people say, I mean, uh, you, the, the Lovejoy Award uh, that you got from Colby talks about uh, your courageousness, um, uh, writing about race and racism. And I wonder, is, do you, how do you feel about that? Do you feel that that's your topic? Uh, well, I feel like, I, th I think it's a little broader than that. I know everybody sort of looks at the race and racism part, but for me, it's more uh, the issue of how we treat each other as human beings. So the larger canvas is not race and racism, but also uh, anti-Semitism, also homophobia, also yeah. Islamophobia, also misogyny against you know women. I'm really fascinated by this whole idea that we have people who believe and who have built policies on the idea that I can be better than you because I was born in X tribe. Uh -huh. And my, my feeling is you may be a better person than me. You may be smarter, better looking, and you know, more, more generous and, and, and more beloved by, by, by men, women, and, and cats, but it won't be because you were born because that's a trick we all manage. It's just nothing more, there's nothing more common in the human experience than being born. I think 7 billion of us at this point have all, just now, that, that are now living, have all managed that, that trick. So the idea that you can be born better than somebody else has always just fascinated me. So that, in, in, in the larger term is, is, is what I write about. And, you know, it was, honor, it was an honor to, to, be, uh, to, to get the Lovejoy Award because I know who Elijah Lovejoy was. I know about, you know, his, his uh, having his printing press, he was an abolitionist uh, editor and having his printing press destroyed four times and finally getting shot on the last, on the last attempt by people who, uh, who resented his, his anti-slavery leanings. I just, you know, I think it's, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd be very proud to, to, to think I was, you know, one fraction of, 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 of what he was in terms, in terms of courage, because that, that was an amazing, his is an amazing story. Matter of fact, I, I wrote about him probably 20 years ago in a piece that I did called oh, uh, White, White Heroes of African American History. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and I, I think he was one of the people, as I recall, he was one of the people that I listed because uh, it's, not a, it's not a story that's well known, but it deserves to be known. Yeah. Um, have, have your, has your approach changed at all over these years, the 20 years or so of uh, writing? Do you write about race more than you used to, less? I mean, I, I think what you've said is that you don't necessarily consider what you're doing writing about race, but uh, you're writing about America, which is you know, part of our story. But I'm wondering yeah. if, how, if, if uh, over time uh, you feel differently about um, writing on this Know, our differences it waxes and wanes it depends on you know on, on what's going on at a given time uh the, the great danger now from having been doing this column since 94 is not to repeat myself or at least not to repeat myself too much uh -huh. there are things, you know there may be an argument that i made 10 or 15 years ago that i feel like okay i need to need to dust that one off and, and redo it but uh, i don't want to be repeating stuff that i said two years ago that that gets to be a little bit uh, a little bit of a, a little bit dicier so there's that concern, but yeah, I think remember what I, you said before. That's the hard part, right? Yeah, I'm always I'm always <laughs> googling and doing and doing nexus searches, 
you know, you, you, you get a great phrase in your mind. You say, wait a minute, that may be a little, that's a real nice turn of phrase, but that may be a little too nice. Let me go and see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That sounds familiar. I did that, yeah. <laughs> I did that back in 2014, doggone it. So I can't do uh, that again. So, yeah, I have reached the stage in the career where you, where you have to Google search yourself to make sure you're not repeating. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what about, tell me about your relationship with readers. Uh, uh, you know, it's a funny, like the thing about having a column and with your mm. picture on it is people feel like they know you. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've seen you on social media, you have, a, you know, have a little back and forth with, uh, with readers. Um, I wonder, you know, how, how's that been for you? It's changed over the years. Uh, it used to be uh, a lot, especially when it was coming in via email. Uh, it used to be a little more substantive. Yeah. Um, I used to delight, and it doesn't happen very often, but I used to delight in finding a reader who disagreed with me and could mount a cogent argument about why and perhaps make me reconsider my point. Uh, this happened back when I was a music critic. Uh, so, you know, maybe it doesn't count, but it sort of illustrates the point. There was a lady. I wrote a piece on gospel music and this lady wrote me this letter and I have never been sliced and diced more. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it was like a, like a, like a sushi chef or something. She just sliced and diced me so well that at the end, all I could do is sit back and imagine the cutting. And uh, she was in West Palm beach, as I recall, and I was in Miami and I actually took a drive up to talk to her to meet her and to, and to learn from her. That's how much I appreciated, you know, somebody who knew more than I did about, about this particular subject. And, and, you know, and who, who had corrected me. So I've, I've always liked the idea of, of, of having that sort of give and take of somebody who can, who can mount an effective argument against you. But the fact of the matter is that that has grown. It was always rare. It has grown incredibly rare these last few years, especially, you know, in, in, on Twitter, which obviously the medium is not built for that, but still it's grown incredibly rare, uh, you know, on Twitter and frankly, via email. Uh, if, it, it, it's it's a weird day when I haven't been called a racist five times by lunch, you know, and it's like, and and, for, and, and I, I have no doubt that, that for these people, that is, you know, that that's their considered and an and, and earnest opinion. But because I understand, you know, where they're coming from, probably better than they do, because I understand race, certainly better than they do. It just becomes something, okay, de delete, 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 delete. And I, there's nothing I can learn from it. There's nothing I can take from it. And it just, it just really gets, it's, de it's, it's depressing in a sense um, because, you know, I, I don't, I'm not under any delusion that I am the, the, the fount of all wisdom. <laughs> you know, I think we all get it wrong. We can all stand to be corrected. We all, you know, none of our perspectives or, or, or whatever, you know, flows straight from, from, from a pipeline from God. So, if I get it wrong, I, I like hearing from people who can who can explain why I got it wrong. But when it's just name calling and 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 you know jargon, you know, and talking points picked up from Tucker Carlson, yeah. it just it just it feels like a waste of all of our time, and it feels like it debases the entire process. To be honest, yeah, and and, and so it's a waste of time, right? You, see, you, you can spend a lot of time um, on those things. Uh, so I've seen you having back and forth, and and uh, you know you give as good as you get and yeah um, but um you had a, a like a terrifying experience uh, uh with the swatting um would, right would you be willing to talk about that yeah uh, no there's a i was well i was awakened i guess two years now uh awakened on a sunday morning at 4 48 by a call from my local police department uh telling me that they had received uh they had received a call that uh, i had murdered my wife uh, and I needed to come out and join them on the front lawn, basically keep the phone in hand and come out and, and, and join them on the front lawn. And it's, it's 448. So I'm kind of not awake. I'm awake, but I'm not awake. So there was really a surreal quality to it. Uh, quality of, am I dreaming this or is this actually happening? And I go out the front door and there's like, uh, uh, a spotlight in my shining in my eyes from, from this side, from my right. And I, you know, I can't see anything and there's a disembodied voice telling me to put down the phone and come forward. And I put my hands out like this, you know, to either cut I wanted my hands as far from each other as they could pot from my body and from one another yeah. as they could possibly be. And I go halfway across my neighbor's lawn and he puts, you know, go down on your knees, hand find, like, like you've seen on television, hand on your back and then no hands up like this. And then somebody comes and puts my hands behind my back and, and, and handcuffs me. 
and marches me back to the to the police car and you know at which point my my murdered wife comes out the front door <laughs> trying to figure out <laughs> trying to figure out why i just suddenly popped up out of bed and you know you didn't tell her what was going no, on i i told the only thing i told because i've got a i've got a police dispatcher in my ear who's demanding my attention so she's what, what's yeah. happening what's, they say i killed you <laughs> they say I'm gonna, and you know which was probably not the best way to leave it with her yeah but you know that's you know uh, i my attention was here on the phone. So I told them, well, it's the police and they say I've killed you and they want me to come out front. So, you know, she comes out front and, you know, the lights on her and, you know, the whole thing, my, my, uh, my uh, daughter and, and her child and, and, and her spouse are in the house and they've got to come out. It's, yeah, it's, it was real. It was, it was an interesting morning. It was a very interesting morning, you know? Uh, yeah, I remember reading the story and just being blown away. Uh, how terrifying that must have been. Uh, and um, did, was anybody ever charged for that? Was there any? Apparently the individual, uh, I just read in the paper, I don't even recall this guy's name, but apparently he was just charged because he'd been doing it to me and a, he'd done it to me and he'd done it to, to a bunch of other folks. And I think he's uh, going to do a year or two or something like that as, you know, as a, as a uh, guest of the state. So, yeah. you know, I, I, hope it, I hope it was worth it for him. Uh, but you know, again, it's it kind of speaks to the moment that we're in. If 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 you can mount an effective argument against me, do it. Right. If it's effect, if it's effective, and I have no I have no pride or no no problem in saying, you know what, you're right, I'm wrong, or you or at the very least, you've given me something to think about. Let me chew on that. Yeah. Because to me, the the, the process is not about my ego. It's not about me being right every time. It's about here's what I here's what I see. And here's how it shakes out for me. And if you can, if you can come back and say, well, no, but you didn't consider this, this, and this, and here's how it shakes out for me, then, you know, we can, we can joust with each other and I can change your mind. You can change my mind. We can change neither of our minds. And then we can go on about life. You know, it, it's, it's not that it's not, my ego is not on the line with that, but, but when you don't have the argument and when you have to do, you know, stuff like this, it just, uh, it, it, it's depressing for a whole bunch of reasons. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that if that was a reader, but obviously they- it, it He was, was somebody, well, he was you know, obviously somebody who had, who had, who had read me at, at some point or, or, or knew yeah. enough to, to know he didn't like me. So yeah, I don't, I don't and, think he had a subscription anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Not like our readers. Um, yeah, no, I'm sure it was. I, mean, I think it's a testament to, to uh, uh, the, the, the tension of the arguments nowadays, you know, and, and, that, and that sense of, uh, you know where it feels like you're at war um yeah and it didn't used to be that yeah it, it, yeah it's so it's so weird i look back i i thought george w bush's presidency was just the end of everything it was the worst thing i'd ever seen and the last four years i told people if bush could be president again i would quit the job and go stuff ballot boxes for him <laughs> and, and, that, and that's not a testament to my opinion of him changing i always thought he was a good man i thought he was a very good man very bad precedent. That, that's always been my take on George W. Bush. But I now realize that there are worse things than a good man who's a bad president. Yeah. <laughs> a, a bad man who's a bad president. You know? 80 million people. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to, uh, to your writing process. Mm -hmm. um, sure. How do you know uh, when something like a stray thought is really a column idea? When it catches on the gears and it won't let go. Um, the, on the typical day when I'm looking for a column topic, I will, you know, scan, graze the news, check Twitter, see what people are, are putting out. Uh, and, you know, maybe I'll be left with two or three topics, but neither, none of them is really sticking out. And then by day's end, uh, you know, a, a, a thought on one of them it has sort of taken root and it leads to another thought. And then, and, and, and then before you know it, you've got, you've got genesis of a, of, of a column. Uh, it's like the column that I just wrote on the um, Atlanta shooter, where the uh, police uh, spokesman said he was having a really bad day. Yeah. That was that, the first thing that came to my mind was imagine how his victims felt. Right. If he was having a bad day, how you know how how did they feel? And yeah. that was the that was the genesis of that whole column. And then, as a matter of fact, imagine how his victims felt became the became the, the close the kicker of the column. But you know that was that was triggered off of that off of that one comment and my immediate reaction to it. So it's. It's if, if one thing, one comment, one thing going on in the news, one whatever springs something else and then that something else springs something else, uh, then you know you've got a column. Plus you've got to care. 
you know that yeah. you know which i guess is what i mean when i say catch on the gears you've got to you've got to care if i don't care about it i can't really write a column about it uh-huh and uh so what is, what is that like a, an emotional attachment to it or or yeah i, I think i think i have to have an emotional investment in it uh i tell younger columnists all the time that if <laughs> if an editor is assigning it to you it's not a column it's a it's a feature story and my, if an editor assigns me something, uh, I can write a, I can write you a perfectly valid feature story, but you can't assign me a column because you can't assign me to care. That you know it, it, you can't do it. And if I because a column is here's my organic framing of the world. Here's here's how I see this thing that's happening in the world. And if the thing that's happening in the world that you want me to write about is something that I either don't know or don't have enough care or connection to then there's not going to be a column about it. Um, many years ago, a lady uh, was trying, she was trying very hard to get me to write a column on the ease with which children can find uh, or could find pornography online. And I kept trying to get her to understand, I understand that this is an important issue, but it's not, it's not something that, that I, I have any, any way into. Right. And I think it was about six months later, I'm watching television in this, in this very office, as a matter of fact, I'm watching television on that side of the room. My daughter's right here behind my computer and she's... <laughs> And she's doing a book report and she has looked up little women and you can guess what she found. <laughs> you can guess what she found, you know, and uh, she, I, and I called across absolutely. Hey, did you find what you're looking for? Uh, no. Well, what what yeah. do you got? I found something that looks kind of nasty. Oh my God. And that's when I had an interest in the issue. Right. And after that, I spun off, I think, two or three columns on, you know, we've got to do something about the ease with which children can find pornography, because then it was personal to me. There was some, there was a way into it for me. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, are you the kind of writer that uh, has to know what you think before you start, or do you kind of come to it as you're, as you're writing? Generally, 99 and a half percent of the time, I, it's something I know what I think uh, uh, when I start. There have been columns. That's why your leads are so good. Uh, I mean, that's because you start out knowing where you're where you're going there, there have occasionally been columns where the feelings were and you, you probably had this experience where they're kind of mushy yeah, yeah. It, it, and it, it's not a hard like the, the the column i just wrote on tim scott um was very hardcore there's no there's no no gray areas it's bang 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 but mm-hmm. you occasionally end up writing a column where there's gray areas and it's, your feelings are kind of ephemeral and kind of mushy and those are the ones where you feel compelled to write it, but you don't know what you're going to say. There was one, as a matter of fact, that I wrote it and then sent it to an editor and said, can you tell me what I'm trying to say here? And she was able to put it in a concrete form. This is what you mean. Oh, thank you. And then I was able to go back and, and, and finish writing the column. But generally, I already have a pretty good sense when I start out what it is I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, you also write fiction. Uh, yes. Models. Yeah, yeah, four novels. Four novels. Uh, so, yeah. how is that different? What, what, uh, what, what, what's a, what's a fiction idea versus a, a column idea? Same or, general uh, thing, only, only on a larger canvas. A fiction idea is, yeah. is, is, you know, characters in a situation that sort of again catch on the gears and won't let go. Yeah. Uh, only the only difference is it's it's happening over a longer period, because when you're writing a column, it catches on the gears Monday, and you're and you're online the columns online tuesday right uh with the novel it's something that you kind of live with and think about over the course of a few months and if it stays with you you start doing research and characters start developing themselves and talking to you and and plot points come up and the next thing you know you're sitting down writing a novel Mm -hmm. yeah um did you uh did you have any you know heroes growing up favorite writers i guess writing heroes or people that you, you you know wanted to emulate yeah, the first writer I consciously emulated was Stan Lee of Marvel oh, Comics. Yeah. <laughs> Marvel the, Comic. first, the first man I consciously emulated, um, Irma Bombeck, uh, Joseph Wambau, Beverly Cleary, uh, mm-hmm. Stephen King was a big hero for me, uh, is a big hero for me writing wise. Oh, I'm, I'm talking to Maine. Oh, my Here goodness. Go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. He's like a, a big industry for us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah well, King King was, yeah. Uh, you know, King uh, was and is just uh, an, an amazing writer to me. So he's he's one of those writers that uh, that I that I measure myself against as well. I can I can see the connection with uh, with uh, Stan Lee. I, mm-hmm. I, I would never thought about it, but um, uh, you felt like you knew him. 
yeah uh, from those little yeah. notes he would write and he had and he like kind of gave you this whole big world uh um just on the you know on a really a throwaway page in a comic book uh right well movie. plus the, the alliteration he just seemed to be having so much yeah. fun with yeah, language. Right. you know yeah. the, the tintinabulating and i looked that up once and it's actually a word the tintinabulating <laughs> this you know and the, the larruping this that's a word stan because it's yeah, not yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. no it's actually a word so he just he, he seemed to be having so much fun with language that uh, I think that really just sort of had a great impact on me. Yeah. Um, you still read comic books? Actually, I do. What, what Actually, do, you, what do you like? <laughs> I am what comics fans know as a as a Marvel zombie. So if it's, uh. <laughs> so, you know, I I still love Spider Man, the Fantastic Four, you uh -huh. know, Daredevil, Captain America. You know, the whole, all, all of the people who are populating the MCU that people are complaining about, uh, you know, ruining, ruining the movie business. You know, <laughs> I'm one of those people helping to ruin the movie business. I'm sorry, go. but yeah, yeah. You know, I love that stuff. I've, all, I've, I've always, I've always loved that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let me talk, talk a little bit of opinion journalism, because, you know, there's so much about, um, criticism of the news media and, 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 you know, you talked earlier about this, uh, uh, this, you know, imperative we have of, of not, you know, of, of finding, looking for the truth and telling it as close mm -hmm. to it as we can. And, um, and often that means, uh, taking our own personality out of, you know, I'm talking about straight reporting out, right. of, the, uh, out of the story. And, um, um, and then you have this section in the back where, uh, we ask people to, uh, you know, tell us, you know, put words to what troubles our soul. And um, uh, how do you think these pieces fit together? And, you know, did you, did you imagine that you would be doing this as a kid? I did not imagine doing this as a kid. My, my imagination as a kid said that I was going to be a novelist. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, full-time full novelist. I am a novelist, but full-time novelist. Uh, but in terms of, you know, opinion and how it fits in, in, into the overall package, I, I think that we've done probably a poor job, and I think cable television news has been, a, has been a big part of this, of educating readers as to the different aspects of, of what we do. I think we, we think they know, and, um, and they don't very often. I've had so many, I, I have probably once a week, a call from somebody or an email from somebody saying, I read that, here's an exact quote. I read that entire article and it was, it was all just your opinion. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what I do. That's, you know, that's, that's, uh -huh. that's what they pay me for. But I don't think people draw the distinctions that we would want them to between opinion and hard news. And I think, again, cable news has been a big uh, driver in that because cable news is so much, uh, it, it's so much of opinion. Uh, it, it's, there's so little, at least that I, that I see of hard news, even on what purports to be hard news, there's a, there's a whole lot of opinion mixed in with it. And I'm, I'm old enough to remember, I mean, I was a kid when it happened, I'm old enough to remember that it was a big deal when Walter Cronkite expressed an opinion on the, on the, um, on the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, and it, you know, it really uh, was an opinion that amounted to an, uh, more of an analysis than a hard, than a hardcore arguing his, arguing a case or whatever it was. I don't think this war is winnable. But that was a bit that was a huge deal because reporters didn't didn't do that pundits did it but now they there's so much cross-pollination uh and so much of the cross-pollination is partisan and ideological that i don't think uh i don't think readers and, and viewers really know or appreciate the difference a lot of times and i think that's bad for for all of us because what it does is it uh it it encourages people to to move to their their information silos right with the, you know with the facts that i get over here have nothing to do with the facts that you get over there uh and as i've been arguing for almost 20 years now if we don't have facts in common we can have different opinions that's fine that, that's that's desirable that we have different opinions but if we don't have facts in common then we have no basis for a good faith argument or good faith debate on anything and that's you know that's that's where we stand right now I just had a, a Twitter exchange with an individual who stated with uh, with perfect serene confidence about how the uh, the um, co coronavirus COVID nineteen was engineered as a bioweapon in a Chinese laboratory. Yeah, 
and what do you even do? How did he find out? Yeah, that was just exactly. a mistake. Yeah. What do you even do with that? Uh -huh. But that was his reality. And he felt sorry for me for not having access uh -huh. to the facts that he had. You know, one day I'll wake up and find out, well, maybe, but I don't think so. So we've been getting a lot of questions from readers, and I want to bring uh, Judy back. Uh, it, Thanks, Greg. Yeah, yeah. we've got uh, coming on 60 questions, so we're going to be here till midnight. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you really have covered a lot of the topics that have been raised as questions, so I'll, I'll pick and choose among the, the ones that we haven't really touched on. Our governmental system seems dysfunctional with little chance of becoming functional. Do you think we're going to work our way out of this? Again, I hope we're going to work our way out of it. Uh, there, there is a road for us to work our way out of it. What the question that sits before us as Americans is not can we because we can. The question is, do we have the will? You know, do do we have the we have if we have the will, there's nothing that we face that we can't fix. But will is is the is the big question that that that, that faces us. So I don't know. It, it depends on us. It doesn't depend on, on external circumstances. It depends on the will and character of the American people to, to decide that enough is enough. And the, the, the shenanigans, the craziness that we've seen the last four years, the last two months, two or three months or how long it's been since the election should be more than enough to shock any sensible people who care about this country into some sense of reality. And even at that price, we're, 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 we're not seeing that. The cognitive disconnect is just amazing to me that the people who claim blue lives matter can, look, can overlook the death of Officer uh, Skolnick at the, um, at the Capitol. And it's all part of the same, the same thing. The Senator of Wisconsin, Ron Johnson, said he wasn't afraid of the, the Capitol rioters because these are people who love their country and have deep respect for its laws and deep respect for, for its law enforcement. And these are the people who broke into the Capitol and killed a police officer. It's just, it, I don't even know what to do with that. It's just amazing. So until, until, we, until we have the will to, to understand that facts, are, that, facts mean, that facts are factual and that logic actually has a place in our, in our, in our, in our cogitations, uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have problems. What tangible markers excuse me, markers or signposts would be evidence for you that racism has been eliminated from our country or at least significant progress made toward that end? Um, I think that when we stop seeing the statistical differences for people of color in basically every quality of life measure, then you'll be able to say that we're that we're doing uh, we're doing a lot better. Uh, the the mistake that a lot of people make is that they fixate on the the um, the outlandish, the, the the name calling, the the you know the 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 stuff that's sort of visual and and and, and right there in front of your face, but they don't look at the um, the hiring practice. They don't look at the fact that a um, African American um, pregnant mother has much worse outcomes than um, uh, chance of outcomes than, than her white counterpart. They don't look at the justice system. They don't look at hiring. They don't look at all the rest of this stuff. They don't, you know, the, the, the statistics and the studies are there. And until and unless we're willing, until and unless we're willing to deal with our own Un, often completely unintentional biases until we're, we're, we're willing to interrogate and deal with those, we're gonna be coming around to the, same, to the same spot over and over again. So the, the markers would be, you know, if, I, if, if, if drug defendant A and drug defendant B, one who's black and one who's white, if they go to court, can they get the same justice? Right now they can't. Drug defendant uh, A who's black is 48 times more likely to wind up behind bars than drug defendant B. When, that, when that's no longer the case, then we can talk about having resolved the problem. What is the column that you want or need deep down to write, but for whatever reason, you haven't written it yet? <laughs> if there was such a column, would I tell you? <laughs> but, but no, there, there, there is no such column. I mean, there are columns that have a longer gestation period because you're, you're sort of dealing with, you know, dealing with the themes or whatever, but there's no column that, that I want or need or really need to write. Because again, that's the whole process. I, I need to write this. I have to say this. That, that's the process that you go to every, every week. So if I haven't written it, it's because it hasn't occurred to me or it's occurred to me, but I haven't, I don't know yet what it is I want to say about it. But other than that, no. 
So you don't shy away from tackling really tough and emotionally charged topics. How do you sustain yourself, stay in balance, stay centered in your personal life? And this presumes that I am centered in my personal <laughs> life. And I thank you for the compliment. Um, no, I think you, you gotta, you got to know when to, you know, and how to shut it off. And it's difficult in this job because there is, it's not really a nine to five situation. It's, you know, I may get a column idea tonight at, at eight o'clock, 10 o'clock. Um, but, you know, you, you still have to be able to have some sort of barriers and, and walls when you're on duty and, and, and when you're off. And you also, you know, I think having faith helps, you know, and I'm talking about religious faith, uh, the sense that every, you know, whatever, there's a lady at my church who has a song called, uh, I win. And then the, and the theme of it is whatever, whatever else happens in the world, you know, I got God, I win, you know, and I, I, I think there's some of that in me. Uh, I got my granddaughter, you know, who's five years old and, you know, the world revolves around her. So when I'm with her, I get to revolve around, around her too. And that's fine. You know, all, all of those things I think help to, to, to keep you from, from growing too um, despondent or, 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 or despairing. Do you have suggestions for understanding people that we disagree with? Listen to them. Listen to them. If, if I think the world would be a lot better, we'd be in a lot better shape if we could master the art of listening to people and questioning them without without judgment. Uh, now, obviously, there are people that you know <laughs> don't make that easy, shall we say? But I think that, and it's not just so much people that we disagree with; it's people that we who, that whose whose journeys, whose passages we don't understand. I think that if we can learn to listen without, without, not just without judgment, but without defensiveness, we can be better off. I'm thinking about the Me Too movement um, because before that broke, before that story broke, I think it was 2017 or 18, if I'm not mistaken. Before that story broke, I'd have told you that, you know, yeah, I understand sexual harassment and sexual, and then, boy, that's a terrible thing. And, you know, I'd probably written a few columns on it, but it's only since then that I understand how ubiquitous, how ubiquitous it is, how it's just like a part of almost every woman's experience. And I made it a point, okay, I'm gonna shut up and listen, you know, women, you tell me. And, you know, and that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to listen more and talk less because this is a subject on which it's not important for me to defend my bona fides as, yes, I'm a, I'm a good guy, you know, I'm an ally, ladies. You know, why don't I just shut up and listen and try to learn where what women have experienced and where they're coming from. And I feel a lot more educated now on, on, a, on the subject than I did three or four years ago when I thought I was educated. And that just comes from, from reading books and, and listening and, and, and trying to understand what I thought I understood before. And I think that we could, we could do a lot of that in a lot of different areas across a lot of different lines of division. What advice do you have for young journalists today? Hmm. Um, I think I, they're probably already doing this, but I think it's very um, crucial to master more than one platform. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a written word journalist, uh, so learning a lot of the other forms has been very has been sort of a challenge for me. But I think that learning different forms, i.e., visual, audio, podcast, the whole, the whole schmear, has been a lot has been more the water that, that they swim in. Uh, I think also, though, that no matter what um, platforms you're presenting your work on, you have to also master the art of telling a story. Because no matter what the platform is, the ability to tell a story doesn't change. That the tools that are necessary to tell the story don't change. And I think that there's a real need to uh, to master the fundamentals of of, of that. Uh, and if I was a, if I was a young journalist, those would be my two priorities: making sure that I, you know, was master of all the all the various platforms, social media, uh, audio, video, you know, whatever, but also that I, in the, in the process of doing that, that I didn't lose uh, or lose sight of the importance of needing to be able to just tell the story. That's, that's great, great advice. You mentioned right. earlier tonight that um, in this country, crises have united us, uh, but the pandemic is a crisis and we are more divided than ever. That's what makes it such a bizarre time, isn't it? <laughs> It's what makes it such a bizarre time, and it's so so emblematic of of, of what we are, uh, of what we have become. Everything is ideo is ideological now. Everything is political, and again, the moment that I saw, you know, 
mobs descending on on uh, the governor's um, on the state house in in uh, in um, Michigan. It told me that we've come into a completely different place, and a lot of that has to do with this being the era of anti-fact, and you know the, this whole idea that you know if I got it from a mainstream news source, then how how dare I trust it? So a lot of it has to do with that. But that really that really is a frightening thing because yeah, in the, in the past crises have brought us at least momentarily together. December 7th did that, November 22nd did that, September 11th did that. But this pandemic has done a completely different thing. The pandemic has, has shown a spotlight on the fissures more than it has brought us together. Uh, and that's, that's a troubling thing. I mean, you, you see some aspects of, of the coming together when you see people and you know, concrete canyons in, in New York serenading um, um, frontline workers and, and healthcare professionals and applauding them and all the rest of them. You see some, some remnants of that spirit, but you also see a lot of, uh, you know, people for whom going maskless is some sort of political statement. Uh, and that's, you know, again, that, that, that's emblematic of how far afield we've drifted from what we used to be uh, as, as a nation, how far we've gone from, I, I spoke about the center line, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an emblematic of how far off the center line we have drifted as a nation, or some of us have drifted. Mm. We, uh, this is a question that I think we have about 12 of them. As an <laughs> author, who do you read right now? And as a music lover, who would you listen to? I read um, Stephen King, uh, Elizabeth Wet. I mean, I read everybody, Elizabeth Wetmore, Connie Schultz, I'm just thinking of books that I've that I've read recently that I've enjoyed. Isabel Wilkerson's book on cast was 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 amazing. Um, I you know I I read a lot of stuff. I, I try to be what I call a promiscuous reader, and just, you know, little little bit of everything. Uh, but those are those are you know King is King is my fiction go to. Uh, Tom Clancy uh, and now the heirs to Tom Clancy, who was never a great writer. Don't get me wrong, but but was always a good storyteller and there's a difference. You know, he was also one of my fiction go-tos. Um, and what was the second part of the question? It was, uh, who do you listen to? What music do you listen to? Oh, geez. Uh, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm right now, because I, I, when I stopped listening to music professionally, I kind of stopped listening to, to anything new. So I've, I'm, <laughs> I'm right now on a voyage of discovery and I've been listening to John Legend for the first time in yeah, I know that's not even a new artist, but it's a new artist for me because I really just shut down everything. And so I'm, I'm enjoying him. I just discovered Dinah Washington on the, at the other end of that spectrum. Uh, I love Dinah Washington. Um, who else? Springsteen, of course. The temp, how can I, the Temptations, who should have been tops on that list. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the Temps, uh, who else is there? Oh, and this, this man, that uh, this individual that uh, you, whose name most of you won't know, uh, but who I consider the, the best songwriter you've never heard. His name is Grayson Hugh. Um, and uh, he's, he lives up, he, he's not as far up as Maine, but I think he's in uh, Connecticut, if I'm not mistaken, or uh, Massachusetts, somewhere up, up that way. Uh, he's just an incredible, incredible talent. Um, his, his album, Road to Freedom, and his uh, most recent album, um, uh, Back to the Soul, are like two of my favorite albums ever. Nice. Yeah. And uh, last question, what inspires you? every day? I get that question a lot and there's two answers. The, the smart aleck one is uh, I like to eat three times a day and I've kind of gotten <laughs> in the habit of it. <laughs> so, you know, but, but the smart aleckness of it hides, you know, hides a serious point, which is that you know, I, I think particularly for a lot of us as young writers, um, there's a tendency to believe that you know, writing must come off of inspiration this, this divine light shines on you and you and you sit down and you you know angel choir sings and you and you write these perfect words and i think becoming a, a writer particularly a professional writer uh involves uh being able to find inspiration don't inspiration doesn't necessarily find you to be able to find inspiration uh because this is what you do come hell or high water uh my editor is going to be looking to me for a column tomorrow at three so you know that, that in a very real sense is, is the inspiration. Uh, and if you're looking for the, the more, the, the less earthy, the more hoity-toity answer, I suppose, uh, would be that um, I want to be, I, I treasure having a voice in the ongoing 
uh, debate, the ongoing discussion. I treasure being able to put my point of view uh, forward for people to, to consider, uh, accept, dismiss, or whatever. I think that's a great, uh, a great gift and a great privilege. So that uh, inspires me you know, every, every morning when I sit down at the keyboard. Well, I hope you recognize from tonight's event that our readers treasure your voice too. And thank, thank you. you so much for joining us. This was wonderful. Your time is um, really nice to have you here. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.